people say amen. I repeat, let all of my people, all the members of the congregation say amen. The Greatest Voice Podcast is live again. We have returned again for another episode of Random Rhetoric at its finest, defining the culture, illustrating where we are at as a society. That was actually a pretty good sum up definition for the podcast. My That was a very good intro. I'm going to actually write that down and start saying that for every episode. But, uh, Welcome to the Greatest Voice Podcast. How are you feeling? Thank you for being a part of the movement. Thank you for being a part of the mob. What is up with you? How are you feeling? What's up? What's up? How are you doing? We shall commence this episode of the podcast with a quote. As we have always commenced every single episode, every single sector of this podcast, with a quote to a song, ballad, melody, or possibly a poem, that really to illustrate where I was at today, where my temperament was at as I woke this morning and tried to decide... What should I talk to my wonderful people about? And I think this quote comes from a song, but it comes from a song that I actually haven't had the opportunity to listen to in entirety. Those of you guys out there who know me very well, you know that I am an immense. I'm talking about if I was a female, I'd be at his show throwing my panties, thongs, and whatever other memorabilia that women can throw at a man. I of Brent Fires. Brent Fire is a young, talented R&B, R&B singer from the area of Washington, D.C., the Diamond State. I don't know why I called it the Diamond State. I think it's called the Diamond Area. But anyway, his newest album comes out on the 19th of this month. He was at a um, an album release party in London. The album is actually called F Up A Bag, somewhere in London, we'll do a whoop. And I heard, I was listening to the, uh, I, 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 my finances were not in the, in the, the, my finances are not in a place right now to where I can even think, even dream, even, even sniff about going to a Brent Fias concert. But in the album release party, I heard his song, one of his new songs playing in the background. And one of the verses from one of his new songs where he said, um, came all the way to London just to hear how they talk. I came all the way to London just to hear how they talk. And those of you guys out there who know me very well, who know that I am a nerd of all things anthropological, I am a culture vulture. I love all cultures. That's why I speak Portuguese. Por eso yo hablo español también. I just love culture. And so, like, when he said that, that kind of, like, I told you guys two weeks ago, I I came back from a cruise, my very first cruise in my entire life. And it was also my very first time stepping outside of my country in my entire life. And I don't know, man, like when he said that it really illustrated where my brain is at, where my heart is at, where my soul is at right now, as far as just my aspirations, like going on that cruise made me realize like how, how much I deprive myself of personal advancement and personal growth by not traveling. You know, that was the first time I stepped outside of my state, California, which is an awesome state. We have the best avocados, most beautiful Mexican women to date, but That was the first time I stepped outside of my state in like three years and my first time stepping outside the country. Like I was it really showed me that I have to expand my borders and how I see the world and just what I'm going through in life. So it was a beautiful thing, man. Shout out to Brent Fires. I cannot wait till his album comes out soon. That verse just made me realize there's so many places I want to go to, whether it's Canada, where it's the where there's the shores of Tahiti, where there's the beaches of southern Spain, whether it's Corazon, where there's Aruba, where there's Costa Rica. There's so many different countries out there, so many different lands that I wanna that I wanna explore, that I wanna have the pleasure of rubbing my toes in their sand and and um, you know, with this podcast, I wanna do it through the funds that I make from this podcast. I wanna do it through the funds and the money that I that I garner from doing voiceover. So um, thank you guys for accompanying me on this career. Shout out to all the new subscribers I have to the channel. Like you guys, um, for the fact that a lot of y'all really will sit down and listen to me for a whole hour and hear me just wax poetic about the most random of topics that I could think of or just was trending on Twitter and I just have no choice to talk about it. I truthfully appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. Like it means a lot. And, um, like I said, thank you for accompanying me on this journey. I hope you guys... Oh, by the way, I hope you guys know. I got business cards now. So, uh, thank you for accompanying me on this journey. And uh, we'll see where it takes us, man. We'll see where it takes me, man. My, uh, my birthday is on t- September 4th. And my goal is by September 4th to be at a point where this podcast pays the bills. It pays for it pays for my living. And I, don't, and I can finally... 
quit my regular job, which is being security guard, which is guarding people's cars and parking lots and swimming pools and, and, and suburbs. So, you know, I want to be able to do it, be a real full time broadcaster for my life. And so um, you guys are helping right now. You guys are helping me reach that dream with every single day. I look at my subscriber count and I see it growing. I see my view count growing. So I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. Like y'all are um, like y'all are the best, man. That's all I can tell you guys. Like, you guys are wonderful. So, uh, with that being said, um, let us get into the topics of pop culture. Let us talk about the culture. Let us wax poetic about what is going on, what is occurring, what is happening in this wonderful thing that is Negro culture or American culture or just worldwide culture, depending on what I want to talk about today. First thing I'm going to get into is at five minutes in, I just really just got all emotional, almost cried all the way to this point. First thing I want to wax poetic about is is the tiger light skin lil wayne video shout out to tiger um for those who don't know tiger released a new album called legendary came out a few days ago very good album i'm not just saying i'm just i'm not just hanging from his nuts because he's from california just because he's from my my coast i'm telling you honestly tiger has released a lot of albums i didn't like the one that came before this the one that came before last one with taste on it i didn't like that one but this one is bomb like this 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 got some slappers on it and one of the songs from that album is called light um light skin lil wayne and the song itself is cool the song ain't what really captivated me what captivated me was the music video following the release of the album where he basically put himself in all of these past hit songs from Lil Wayne. Not all of them. Like, it's like three or four. Lollipop, Fireman with Lollipop. He's dancing on top of the limo. Like, how he wasn't... Like Lil Wayne wasn't Lollipop. Um, in the Amelie video, he's coming out of the um, the tour bus and getting prepared for his music video shoot just like Amelie or concert just like Amelie. Um, the Fireman shoot, he's in the fire... He's, he's, he's in the middle of some randomly burning uh, plot of land wearing Timberlands and no shirt and shit and uh, all muscled out. That was one thing. I was thinking about that too. Like when I was watching the videos, no homo, no, I'm not gay, but I will say this. As far as hip hop artist bodies go, it is very underrated how well in shape Lil Wayne has stayed throughout his entire career. And seeing Tiger in all these little video <laughs> clips made me think about that. Like I was really thinking like, Lil Wayne has really kept his six pack since he was since he was sixteen years old. Ever since the block is out, like he has not lost a pack since. Like, <laughs> so shout out to Tiger, he did a really good job. Of, uh, this video meant a lot to me because he did a really good job of just like it was cute. Like, I like that the video. I like that in the video you won't see how much in, you won't see. The song, when you listen to the song itself, you don't catch anything like him trying to cater to Lil Wayne outside of the intro and the outro. You hear uh, sound clips of Lil Wayne talking about just trying to work hard and success, success, etc., etc., such buying government cheese and Section 8 housing projects, like stuff like that. But when you watch the music video, that's what really kind of just sequences everything all together. And um, I didn't read Lil Wayne's response to the video. Apparently, he had this very overly emotional and, oh my God, my little light-skinned son has made me feel so complete i really am a legend out here in these streets and talking you let me know that let me just say this if tiger is a since we can see since now we can do that as a culture now we can say we just the light skin dark skin versions of niggas if tiger is a light skin lil wayne dang it i'm the dark skin orlando bloom there i said it i said it i said it. i don't give a dang who i don't give a dang what you say i'm the dark skin orlando bloom Yes, if you don't know who he is, then god dang, you need to watch Pirates of the Caribbean or re, uh, watch Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship, re, any Lord of the Rings movie you should see. Dang it, I'm the dark-skinned Orlando Bloom. I'm the only, I, they, I, I haven't met one Negro, I haven't, I have not met one Negro YouTuber with a jawline like mine and chin like mine, therefore, I claim our dark-skinned Orlando Bloom. Now, that means that, uh, all jokes aside about the video, because the video's dope, I like it, I like that, I like that. You have a younger artist, quote unquote, who's paying homage and paying respect to Lil Wayne, especially somebody like Tiger, who right now is as hot as fish grease right now. Like, I never thought in 2019 that Tiger would be hotter than Tiger's doing. Think about Tiger. Tiger gonna keep a hit in the radio. Like, Tiger gonna keep a hit. Tiger at least, Tiger got, there's at least about seven, eight songs circulating on the radio in heavy rotation with Tiger's name on it. Girls have fun. Taste. Goddamn. Light skin Lil Wayne. Light it up. 
um, that one saying, "Run, girl, I'm trying to get you." Like one thing about Tiger, when he get in the when he get in the niche, when he when Tiger get in the corner, when he get in the corner, he can make some hits. He don't stop. Like that's one thing about Tiger. So shout out to him for that. What I wanted to talk about going from that conversation is how influential Lil Wayne is not just in Tiger, but just in every single rapper that you see nowadays with Lil attached to their name, with colored dreadlocks. I'm not talking about just with dreadlocks. I'm talking about with the colored pink and purple dreadlocks, whether it's with the sound of like when I think of YNW Melly, when I think of Lil Pump. When I think of um, Uzi Vert for Shully, I see just fruit off of Dwayne Michael Carter's tree. For those who don't know, that's Lil Wayne's name. And it's kind of never spoken about to me. To me, it's never spoken about about how much Lil Wayne influenced this whole generation of rappers that's coming up right now like nobody ever talks about that like even the fact of how popular for those of you guys out there who are at least 25 and above do you remember how popular being a blood was after Lil Wayne started wearing after Lil Wayne released Unblooded on that dedication popular was to be a blood do you remember how everybody suddenly had red rags and suddenly everybody had gang ties everybody knew everybody uh knew Fruit Town Pyru I remember uh I feel like I, I tried to explain this to my father last October. He didn't understand what I was saying because he he took it as me saying, "Oh, so you trying to see?" Like, "Oh, so you trying to say?" Because my dad's a blood. Oh, so what you trying to say is everybody started be, becoming a blood because Lil Wayne became a blood. What you trying to say is Mozzy became a blood because Lil Wayne became a blood. I was like, "Dad, no, that's not what I'm saying." What I'm saying is, Lil Wayne opened up an avenue to where. There was a lot more popular when Snoop Dogg was at his highest point in his career. When Snoop Dogg was at his highest, when Dog Pound was at their highest, the biggest thing was being a crip. And I think with Lil Wayne just overly in overly just diving into wearing the red rags and saying blood all the time, got these little white kids going to their little functions and formals at their little high schools and be uh and saying that they bloods. It opened up the it opened up a popularity. It opened up a platform for popularity. That's why you have it like where I feel like this is my personal belief. As far as gang wise goes, and we're going to get out of that in a minute. I feel like YG, I feel like all those other dudes, Mozzie, I feel like they wouldn't have the platform to be as popular being blood just from being a blood. They wouldn't have the platform for that as big as it was had it not been for Lil Wayne to popularize that even more. Now, bouncing back to the music side. Even when you listen to YNW Melly and listen to Uzi Vert and you hear that rock hip hop emo, I think Lil Wayne is the innovator of, of emo hip hop. And when I say emo hip hop, I'm talking about the sounds that I hear coming out of Lil Peep, R.I.P. Lil Peep. I'm talking about the sound that I hear come out of Lil Uzi Vert. I'm talking about the sound that I hear coming even out of YNW Melly. Like, I feel like, or my boy, what's his name? Uh, good love for a minute. Uh, trippy Red. I feel like all of those are fruit. Emo hip hop to me is just fruit off a little way in street. Emo hip hop, being a blood, wearing colored dreadlocks, being diminutive. I feel like all of that is fruit off a little way in street. And I do feel nobody gives Lil Wayne his just due respect for that because we just we just never noticed it. We never paid attention to it. You know, like it's it is something to be said about that. And then we could have a conversation from there. But then we can yeah, because we can have a conversation from there about what makes somebody influential in hip-hop and who really are the most influential people in hip-hop for this generation and the generation that's coming up under us me personally i can tell you from my generation the most influential hip-hop artists that i've seen for me that come out of my generation or younger i'm gonna say little wayne and the migos hear me out I will say Lil Wayne, you know, generally speaking, when we get in these conversations about influential hip hop artists and the people who 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 set the foundation and carve the mold and carve the statue and set the standards. Everybody always just goes Drake. Kendrick Lamar or Drake. I'm not sorry, Drake, Jay-Z, stuff like that. And Drake is influential. There's no denial that Drake is influential. I see a lot of Drakes. The reason why I will say Lil Wayne and Migos is because off of just sure, just off of the sheer numbers of 
imitations and copies. For those of you guys who were at least 18 or 17 in 2013, do you remember when the Migos came out with Versace Versace? And do you remember how unique their flow sounded? Even then, I thought their flow sounded dope. I just wasn't really fucking with their music. When I listened to Versace at that, at that time in my life, I would literally just fast forward past their part, past take. Well, not fast forward. I would just keep skipping right back, reversing right back to Drake's part in the beginning. But do you remember when, when, when the Migos came out? Do you remember from that summer of 2013 to the summer of 2014, do you remember how many niggas you saw coming out, being released, who sounded just like all three of these niggas? I mean, just everybody. Like, I felt like everybody who came out post-2013 to uh, 2014 to 15 and was from down south particularly, they all were just rip-offs off the Migos. Even when I listen to the Baby now, like, I think the Baby is dope. I think the Baby is lit. To me, he sounds like a doper version of the Migos, and he couldn't tell me that he wasn't influenced by their sound to some degree. A lot of the times, we can't we can't really see the we can't really see the dopeness in the Migos because we just look at it as like mumble music or just street nigga music. And but to me personally, I think they were very influential. Like it is something to be said about how you can come out as a group. You and your homies can come out as a group, right? Y'all make a few good songs, Versace, Belushi, whatever, whatever you want to call the songs. And within seven to 12 months, there's like 11, 13 other young niggas trying to rap exactly like you, trying to copy your cadence, trying to copy your flow. It is something to be said about that. Uh, I will put them right now, as far as my generation goes, I'll put them on the most influential list. Migos for surely. I put Lil Wayne as top. The two follow ups would probably be Drake and and Drake and Future, just because with Future, like I said, when Future came out, bro, I feel like when Future came out, Future, Future, when Future came out, after right after Future came out, I saw it's the same thing. It was the same thing. Like I just saw all these dudes trying to imitate that sound, and some were doing it better because I didn't like it. Y'all know those of y'all who knew me when I was in college. I hate. I can stand. I hated Future. Loved Young Thug for some reason. I don't know what I loved about Young Thug. It's just, I loved him. I loved him. Despite the fact that he sounded like Courage the Cowardly Dog trying to explain the story when he gets on the beat, I loved Young Thug. I'm a bitch, but I'm gonna make the family the uncle. They make it love, the family the uncle. They make it love. That was, man, that was, just, that was a, that was a good time in my life, man. I was living in Arizona. I was working as a nightclub promoter. That was my family, the hooker. That was my line, the family, the hooker. That was my, sh- oh, that was my jam. God, I wish I could go back to that, to that, to that semester of college. But um, moving past that, yeah. So I, I mean, it is something to be said about how influential, influential they were. So I want you guys to let me know that in the comments, by the way. Like, who do you feel were the most influential hip hop artists? For your generation or my generation, even just now, like who do you think are the most influential? And also, I guess you can talk about what defines defines influential. To me, what defines influential is how many people try to imitate you, how many people try to copy your sound, how many people try to be you. Uh, let me know. Speaking of which, while we're on a hip hop, while we're on a hip hop nerd conversation, uh. Much love and credence to the legendary, much love and credence to the legendary music producer, the mega mind that is and shall always be Jermaine Dupree, and much love to the beautiful, uh, <laughs> much love to Cardi B. There was some a little bit of a uh, a verbal kerfuffle between Jermaine Dupree, not a not between, truth be told, it's just Jermaine Dupree made some statements and. Cardi B followed up with her own in response to his statements because, in essence, people, People Magazine, I think it was People Magazine that was interviewing him at the time, they asked Jermaine Dupri, and for those who don't know, Jermaine Dupri literally is one of the greatest music producers of all time. He's actually a pretty good rapper to me, in my personal opinion, but one of the greatest producers, talent managements. He was behind Bow Wow. He was behind, he was behind uh, uh, Criss Cross. He was behind The Brat. He was behind Them Franchise Boys. It's a lot of people who fed their families because of the helping hand of Jermaine Dupree. So he, I respect his opinion. Truth, honestly. 
And they asked him who did he think was the top female MCs in hip hop right now. And he basically said, like, you know, we'll do whoop. It's, they all he basically he basically said what everybody over thirty five says once they get older and they they've gotten past their hoeing days. Oh, all the music sounds the same, you know, hip hop artists they, there's no really no difference. It's just all the female sound they're just using their sexuality. All of them are strippers that can rap. That's what he said, basically. And that's what I think made Cardi respond because in essence that was the key word. When he said, <sighs> when he said that all of them are strippers that can rap, that that was the key thing that made him, that kind of, I guess, um, caught Cardi B's attention. And Cardi B made a put a video on Instagram and she saw, she, she didn't really say anything disrespectful to Jermaine Dupree, but she just was like, you know, you know, I hear a lot of people say that about how we don't rap about, you know, a lot of female rappers now, we don't rap about things of substance, we don't rap about topics that really matter we just rap about our pussy and our sexuality etc etc and she said she just said what anybody else really would say i rap she basically said to sum up in my own words i rap what the people want to hear if i rap about conscious rap and i rap about stuff that if i rap about the dream center the homeless programs if i rap about kids running away from home y'all ain't gonna play that at the club but if I rap about the street shit, the nigga shit, then you guys are going to feed on that like it's a honey and peanut butter sandwich. And for those of you guys who have never had a honey and peanut butter sandwich, it is an amazing snack, a delectable offer. I highly encourage you to take time to have one. And this is a very redundant, just like overly repeating conversation in hip hop about rapping about things of substance, quote unquote, Versus rapping about the bubble gum, we in the club, we popping, I'm popping my pussy, it's a six foot seven nigga named Brad trying to have sex with me. There's always debate between those two things. Um, how I look at it is like this. Since the beginning of hip hop, as far as I know, as far as I can kind of remember, there's always been female artists who use their sexuality to gain attention, to kind of be, to be the selling point of their image. I can't knock them because as far as I remember, there's always been male hip hop artists who have used their bank statements, quote unquote, use ostentatious behavior, use chains, cars and in, in for cars for from, from foreign countries. They don't have the ability to pronunciate um, just a wild houses, groups of We've all men have always used materialism as a selling point of why they're the dopest rapper. Look at Jay Z. Look at Master P. Look at Birdman. You like uh now Bird? I don't want to think take Birdman out of it. Look at Jay Z. Look at Drake. They've always used um like material stuff as a selling point. I don't I f- I don't think those are reflections of how hip hop is losing its soul and it's depreciating in value. And dep- it's just a. All it is to me is just an exa- is just a um, an echo of where social standards show that we are at in the culture. Reality is, most men, a lot of men, try to gain and try to garner, try to win the attention of women, try to win their favor by how much money they have, by how much stuff they have. They base their social status after that. There are a lot of women out there who base their social status based based what they can obtain in this world off their looks off their beauty that's why i feel like every every three every three out of ten girls that i see on on instagram right now are trying to be models or trying to be trying to so tell me tuck tees this it is what it is from what i've seen um it's It's just, to me, it's just a reflection of society. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I like Cardi B. And it, I, it was a slow love for me to take time to actually really love Cardi B because I, I first, I hated her voice. I, I, I just hated her voice. Like, she sounded like that one annoying aunt who's like maybe like seven to eight years older than you, but she thinks she know everything. Like, I couldn't stand that. Um, I, she was cool. She, I, but now I like her music. I, I, I so much love her personality. I love her honesty. I love the fact that she's not afraid. She has no hesitation to be vulnerable. I love that about her. Um, I just, I just think, I just think personally, man, is it's just a reflection of core we had as a culture. I mean, it's, a it's a reflection of society. That's how it's always going to be. You know, before you had Cardi B, you had the Nicki Minaj's. I didn't like the, I, I never liked the fact that I feel like fifty to sixty percent of 
Nicki Minaj's selling point what kept her in her career was because she was supposed to be this beautiful woman with this with this big plastic injected ass. Like part of that is her selling point. Um is that ever going to change? No, because if you go ten years in the past, that was what Lil Kim was. You know, that's what Trina was. Trina was man. Trina was a mug. Trina was a mug. But Trina could rap though. Trina was different. Trina could, Trina could actually rap. Hey, you went on there though. Think about that like me. That about that like me. Like Trina was a, Trina was a mug. Bro. I remember. I that, well, I moved down south because I moved down south like when she was kind of starting to fall out of popularity, and they used. Oh my God, they loved them country niggas down there. They loved. They loved them. Trina boy, so you know it is what it is. I mean, um, you always, like I said, you're gonna always see those two selling points common amongst men and common so common amongst women, you know. And it's rare you see the opposite, you know. It's rare you see, you know, yeah. I don't really see that many rappers who kind of rap about being a pretty boy. I just thought about that. Like, I don't see that many. I don't know if it's no homo. I ain't seen as many cute rappers. I know the baby does that, like. Did the baby be like, I'm, but the baby always has that that thing. I'm the prettiest chocolate nigga alive, which I took offense to that because I feel like I'm the prettiest chocolate nigga alive. I don't know what this, know what this nigga talking about. I'm I'm the dark skin Orlando Bloom nigga. You're the nigga. You're the dark skin. You can be the dark skinner. You can be the dark skinner. Uh, Aragorn. Aragorn. Aragorn has a very comely face. You can be him. He's he's a nice looking young man. But I'll be dark skin Orlando Bloom. You be dark skin Aragorn. So uh, you know it is it is it is it is what it is. Um. Um. Let me know what you guys think about that, because that's my opinion about that. I don't, I don't really have that much to say about that. Moving past that, I saw that R. Kelly got arrested again. Um, they're charging him with 13 counts right now. One of the, uh, one or three of the federal counts is fed, is sex trafficking. Let me tell you something. And I saw everybody on Twitter talking about this. This is like the eighth, ninth goddamn time that this has happened. In the, uh, I'm not, I'm not jumping for joy with this. I'm so sick of the fact. First off. R. Kelly should have been been in jail. That's the first thing. He should have been been in jail. I, and I'm going to reiterate the same point that I made five months ago when that god dang uh, 85, 85 part Lifetime series came out, which they're making a part 2-2 two two right now. We have known that this man has been a pedophile since damn, since I'm, I'm going to use exaggeration, since the beginning of time. My first acknowledgement, my first being aware of who R. Kelly was, was the sex trials, was the being charged for being a pedophile, was him being a little girl. That was my first impression of R. Kelly. I have always known him to be a pedophile. People before me who were born before me knew that he was a pedophile because he married a legal, and she was 15 years an actual legal birth certificate of the shit, actual legal marriage certificate of the shit, and then forging her age. Like, why are we trying to all act... It really disgusts me that the Chicago Police Department, and you know, maybe it's not just because of the Lifetime documentary. Because two years ago, they tried to pin, they tried to pin charges on him for kidnapping when those, uh, when he had that whole little sexual weird thing. Now they, they didn't even pin no charges on him. Yeah, no, f that. Back to what I was saying. It took a documentary on Lifetime. Some white woman named Ruth, or whoever her name was, had to put together a documentary for you to say, you know what? We need to get him off the streets now. Now we need to get him off the streets. It could be your daughter next, like. That's corny, bro. That's bunk, bro. That's like, bro, like, he's saying, bro, like, that's just corny to me. Like, he should have been, been in jail. Like, I don't, I don't see, like, y'all are fake to me. Then you have all these people who are trying to come out and demonize him now. Like, y'all were all in the studio with this man. Now, with that being said, I still listen to R. Kelly's music. I still listen to his music. The reason why I can listen to his music, I always tell people the same thing, is because I can listen to Freeman Savage music knowing well for a fact that he probably did 85% of what he's talking about. I can listen to D-Steez's music. I can listen to Casanova's music knowing he probably really did rob people for recreational fun. I can listen to the stuff like that. So it's the same thing with R. Kelly. Hey, at the end of the day, it's hard to have morality in hip-hop. And that's why I, I hate it when I see the rappers and I see the entertainers in, in our culture trying to come out against R. Kelly because a lot of y'all were in pocket with this man. A lot of y'all did business with this man. So... Y'all, that's just fake to me, bro. It's just fake. You know, hell, if y'all felt that same type of way, it shouldn't have took a lifetime documentary because truth be told, you probably you probably knew more about what was going on than we did because you was with this man. So that's my personal opinion. Thank you for listening to the Greatest Voice Podcast. Thank you for being a part of the family. I apologize that the episodes are so short right now. It's just that it takes very long to edit this podcast at the video. So guess what it is what I much love and peace and chicken grease. I shall see you. We shall have the conversation again 
to uh, probably Monday or Friday, depending. But much love. Thank you for being a part of the family. And I shall see you some other time. Much love.